Welcome back to The Review. I'm your host, Kale Green. Today, we're talking about dead dolphins, cancel culture, and nutritional ethics. Welcome to The Review. Here is what you might have missed. About a month ago, a few conservation groups and animal rights activists teamed up for a social media takedown launched online against indigenous hunters in the North Atlantic for their practice of hunting dolphins and the record-breaking catch they had this year. The social media blitz successfully garnered millions of likes, comments, and shares from people, including celebrities, around the world in less than 24 hours by showing graphic images of more than 1,400 white-sided dolphins lying on the shores of the Faroe Island fjords. This resulted in an outpouring of hate against a small, marginalized island community of the North Atlantic for practicing deeply rooted hunting traditions that they believe to be essential for maintaining their way of life. For those who don't know, the Faroe Islands are here. There are about 48,000 people who live on the 18 incredibly picturesque, rocky volcanic islands between Iceland and Norway. The first people to settle the island were Irish monks in the 6th century, but the first long-term permanent inhabitants were settlers from the Norwegian Vikings in the 9th century. The people of the Faroe Islands have a long tradition of subsistence hunting and marine mammals going back to at least the 1200s. Back in the day, it was a necessity brought upon by life circumstances. The islands are treeless and vegetation is sparse. Even today, importing food there is expensive. For many on the island, not eating marine mammal would be a cumbersome financial obstacle. While pilot whales are one of the main subsistence staples of the local people, largely due to their size, dolphins have always been on the menu too. And large harvest of dolphins aren't new. The previous single record harvest had been in 1940, according to local biologists near the islands, when hunters took 1,200 dolphins. However, most years, the number is significantly lower than the staggering amount reported in a single day this year. In 2020, the hunters reported taking 35 of the dolphins, and in 2019, just 10. The number of pilot whales taken usually range from about 600 to 800, while the population of white sided dolphins is considered healthy by the international community and is labeled as least concern with counts in the North Atlantic covering around 92,000. In an interview with the BBC, the chairman of the Faroese Whalers Association said that it was probably a mistake to take as many dolphins as they did this year, but it was likely that the hunters didn't realize the size of the herd until they had corralled them into the shallows and the killing process began. During the hunt, Faroese fishermen spot the pods of cetaceans and form a semicircle around them with their boats. They then drive the animals to shore by banging against their boats, trapping them with assaulting walls of sound. Counting animals in the water isn't as easy as counting them on land, and the methods used for hunting involve a tricky process of getting the animal to go from deep water to shallow water. All hunters have to go through mandatory training to make sure they know how to most humanely kill the animals by quickly severing the spinal cord but the protests coming in online bring up interesting points about indigenous rights and culture. Influencers online flock to condemn the activities while bringing down the weight of their considerable international followings. Many aim to utilize mass international outrage to shame the community into stopping the dolphin hunt. Some clearly stated that tradition is no longer a valid excuse for the hunt. And while the images of where these people get their food and the sheer size of the catch may be daunting to folks around the world who don't eat marine mammals, it's interesting to see how this issue fits with the growing global movement to respect indigenous culture. Here's a group of indigenous people who have been practicing this for nearly a thousand years. This type of ingrained activity, particularly around traditional foods, can form the basis of a culture and can be very important to an individual's identity. While it might seem gruesome and horrific to eat whale and dolphins to a group of largely white middle-class people growing up eating pigs and chickens killed in slaughterhouses so big it's hard to even imagine their scale, if the hunt these people partake in is sustainable, is it wrong? Is it our job to yuck another culture's yum because it doesn't align with our values? Regardless of tradition, we should all be critical of cultural practices that involve infringement of other people's rights. There's not a single person who can convince me there's a justifiable reason to accept a traditional use of slaves, cannibalisms, or ethnic hatred. If you want to criticize how the Taliban treated women in the 1990s throwing acid in the faces of women trying to be educated, you'll find me in full support. Most people in modern societies recognize that the lives and liberties of other human beings should be respected. But what about animals? Where and how do you draw that line? 
are other cultures wrong if they don't have the same views towards animals that we in Western societies and Western liberal democracies tend to have? In this case, I think it's helpful to drill down a little and ask why exactly some people are outraged by the dolphin hunt. Is it because it's always wrong to kill marine mammals? Is there something about dolphins specifically? Is it the intelligence of dolphins or is it just that the number that of them that were killed seems daunting? I want to look at these questions quickly. Because if it's the sheer number of them and the hunt is still sustainable, I want to know what the issue is with 1,400 specifically. In places like Alaska, with a standing population of around 200,000 moose in the entire state, people harvest around 7,000 moose a year. That population isn't in jeopardy and it's a sustainable hunt. Would it be worse if somehow it was all done in a single day rather than stretched out over the course of the year? What I'm trying to get at here is if I told you they killed 700 or 5,000, how would you determine what the acceptable number is? Some activists brought up the health effects of eating dolphins, specifically around the mercury content found in their meat and its toxicity to humans. Dolphins are at or at the near top of the food chain. Kid, what's eating you? Nothing. He's at the top of the food chain. <laughs> toxins, including mercury, can accumulate in their bodies. And according to way too much digging into this, the amount of mercury in pilot whales, which are about as close as I could get to finding out the amount of mercury in dolphins, and given that they're both basically apex predators who live in the same region, they had two micrograms per gram of mercury. That number is around five times higher than the amount found in tuna. And while I know it's not a perfect idea to assume that the amount of mercuries in dolphins is the same as that in pilot whales, since they're totally different species with different metabolisms and different food and different environment, it's as close as we can get. And many analyses that I've read use these animal in regard to their mercury content as basically interchangeable. But if I'm being honest, the criticism about mercury feels a little hollow to me. Mostly because if the people are aware of the risks and they're only affecting themselves, it seems like a non-starter. The Faroese government has been cautioning residents to be careful with the amount of dolphin and whale they consume due to the high rate of mercury and other chemicals for decades now. Those information campaigns led to decreases in the amount of whale and dolphins consumed by women while pregnant, just like the same information campaigns worked to decrease the amount of tuna consumption in pregnant women here in the United States. If it's the intelligence of the dolphins that upsets people, I'm curious to know what they think about bacon. Do they abstain from eating other similarly intelligent animals like pigs? Is the outrage analogous? Generally, the smartest animals after humans are thought to be chimpanzees, elephants, dolphins, crows, and pigs. But for some reason, pigs are very much on the menu. Is it something about the cuteness of pigs versus dolphins? I get that pigs are dirty creatures, but that can't be the only reason that we find it justifiable to breed and slaughter them by the millions in unmarked apatois scattered across the country. Side note, did you know that we kill 121 million pigs in the United States a year? If you just don't think dolphins should be on the menu, are you willing to subject your diet to a similar pressure wielded by the global majority? It probably sounds fine when you're in the majority of thought, but just awful when the shoe is on the other foot. We do see dolphin safe tuna in a can. Why doesn't anyone appear to care about the tuna? Why not have tuna safe dolphin in a can? His finger looking good. Mm. Either way, one of them dies and gets canned for people to eat. There are cultures around the world that hunt marine mammals. But another aspect of this debate is that some people seem to struggle with the idea that the Farinese are even indigenous. We tend to associate the word indigenous with darker skin, non-European people. But the Farinese people, despite their lighter skin, fit neatly into any definition of indigenous people that you can find. According to the United Nations, indigenous peoples are inheritors and practitioners of unique cultures and ways of relating to people in the environment. They have retained social, cultural, economic, and political characters that are distinct from those of the dominant societies in which they live. And I'm not sure how a group of people practicing their traditional hunt and eating their traditional foods while being in a mi minority in the Danish kingdom wouldn't qualify them. And beyond that, is it even up to us whether to say they are indigenous? Shouldn't the Farinese have a say in answering that question too? As a side note, I also feel like I need to push back against the idea that dominance is a necessity to being indigenous. Had Russia not laid claim to Alaska and Alaska not been purchased by the United States, would it somehow make the strong traditions of my native friends somehow less valid? Would their indigenous experience have been cheapened in the eyes of the world by the lack of recognition on the world stage? Absolutely not. In the end here, the fact is that these Farinese are the original inhabitants of the island. Whether we're comfortable using the word indigenous to describe them or not, it's clear that they see themselves as having a distinct culture and a right to self-determination. And who are we really to say otherwise? Remotely controlled from New York, Paris, London, so from these. 
det er en moderøst i Færgjøen. Det er det å takke på Watson og si kjøper for det. For det er ikke noe som en kulturimperialisme. Ja, helt sikkert. Det er ikke noe som er mørkt og mørkt verden. Og det er ikke bedre, bedre, bedre. Thank you so much for joining on another episode of The Review. This is definitely taking a departure from what we've talked about in the past, e.g. Alaska-specific content, but I thought it was important. And more importantly, I was tired of seeing the issue being presented as so one-sided. I hope you've learned a little something, or at the very least, question what seemed like a unified front on a global stage. This is the first episode of The Review. is finally up and out on its own. And if you like this type of content and want to see more, like, subscribe, share, or follow. Thanks so much. I'm Kale Green. See you next time.